Okay, you're, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to try a bit uh, as a demonstration of, uh, <clears throat> of Google uh, German. And I want you to compare my German with the assistive technology German. So, uh, guten Morgen, uh, meine Damen und Herren, Zürich, willkommen zu diesem Symposium über assistive technology. Oops. Symposium über assistive technology. Let me do it again. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Herzlich willkommen zu diesem Symposium über assistive Technologie. No, honestly, which was better? <laughs> so, the last time I was in Vienna, the word Google didn't exist. Um, smartphones didn't exist. Um, so the, the difference in a relatively short space of time uh, is, is enormous. Um, but today, in a sense, we don't want to focus quite so much on how amazing the technology is. We want to focus also on what is the environment you need to create so that the technology can, can be amazing. So we're going to have different perspectives because we are interested in high, low, and uh, middle income contexts. Um, and we're going to hopefully have some very uh, useful uh, discussion as we try and sort of interrogate what are the facilitators and, and barriers. So I think we start with the, the first presentation, uh, which is my own. Um, and I am uh, Mac uh, McLaughlin. I'm from uh, Maynooth University in Ireland. Uh, where I'm the director of a recently established institute uh, called the Assisting uh, Living and Learning uh, Institute. I'm here in my role as the research and innovation uh, lead for the World Health Organization program, uh, global program on assistive uh, technology. So this is a program with over, I think, a thousand uh, organizations and members at, at the moment. And our mission is really to try and provide good quality, affordable assistive technology uh, throughout the world, including in some of the poorest regions uh, in the world. I'm just trying to move on to the next. Uh Okay, so some of you may have met uh, my uh, colleague Chapal Kasnabis, who is the lead within uh, the World Health Organization for the Assistive Technology Program. Um, and th this program has really come through his uh, enthusiasm and, and leadership uh, around assistive technology. And this sort of firm belief he has that you can really have good products available to people, uh, even in the poorest contexts. But Gate is also interested in the very high-end uh, uh, products uh, as well. So um, the, the, the sort of hook for this symposium is to do with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, amazing to think that there's over a billion people uh, in the world who could benefit from assistive technology, and only 10% of them have access. If you look at some types of technology, like hearing aids, about 3% of people who could benefit from them uh, have access. Um, and of course, we're talking about people with disabilities, but we're also talking about um, people with chronic illness, uh, frailty, uh, functional decline that's associated with older age, um, and the, the population demographic that's shifting in a way that impairment of some type is going to become more and more the norm for the majority of people. Uh, so what, what is clear from this, the current situation is that our existing approaches uh, 
cannot deal with this increased demand and this increased uh, right and our ability to provide for it. So we really need to do something uh, very urgently and very radically uh, different from what we've been doing at the moment. Um, many of you will be very familiar with this, but I just want to emphasize that the idea that uh, an assistive product, the primary purpose is to maintain um, or improve the individual's functioning and independence and thereby promote their well-being. So it's really any sort of technology that seeks to uh, achieve that goal. And we use the term assistive technology uh, to talk in a very general uh, way. I'm also going to talk about um, systems and this is referring to the development and application of organized knowledge, skills, procedures, and policies relevant to, to the provision, use, and assessment of assistive products. So around particular products, we need a whole infrastructure, and that might be ICT, it might be IO, it might be the internet uh, of things, it may be other physical uh, components as well. One of the things that uh, GATE is uh, known for is the production of the assistive products list, uh, which we refer to as the APL. Um, and our, our aim, our motivation, motivation for doing this was to um, promote awareness, uh, increase availability, uh, establish standards. Um, standards is, is a, maybe an issue that we'll come, come back to. Um, market shaping, which I'll talk a bit about, um, stimulate further innovation and training, and of course the financing uh, around these issues. So to develop this list of um, assistive uh, products, we went through quite a lengthy process of a, a literature review identifying uh, a whole range of assistive products. We then had a Delphi procedure, which is an expert consensus um, consultation um, where we went around 200 people three times getting their input as to what they felt were um, essential as assistive products. Um, so these were experts chosen from over 50 countries. Um, we then also had a, a global uh, survey and as you can see there that there were 10,000 um, plus respondents to this global survey the survey was in 52 languages in various formats, and we had respondents from 161 countries, 38% of whom were people who self-identified as having some sort of impairment or disability. So we managed to reduce, if you like, by people rating how good products were, how essential they were, um, we managed to reduce from 200 down to 100, and then we had 50 top products from the, the experts in the Delphi procedure. We had another 50 from the global survey. We spent a day talking about the similarities and differences. And then the second day, we came up with lots of arguments, pro and for, lots of really difficult um, ethical uh, decisions about what is more essential, um, because ultimately, we were pursuing a very utilitarian approach. What sort of product can do the most good for the most people in particular uh, settings? And we, in that, in that meeting, were particularly focused on the, the most uh, deprived settings, the, the sort of poorest uh, countries. At the end of it, we were still talking to each other, um, which, is, which is the good part, um, and we uh, developed a a list of 50 products which you can go on the web um, and download. Um, and it's important to say that this list of products, it's, it's a minimum uh, that's recommended. So part of the ethos for developing this was back in the 70s and 80s, there was very uneven access to a range of different medicines. Um, and so there was the creation of the essential medicines list and one of the things that that's done is it's made access to things like antiretrovirals, antibiotics, antimalarials um, more affordable because of guaranteed larger bulk uh, purchasing across a number of different countries. 
So what we imagined was that a list of, a, of priority assistive products might achieve the same sorts of goals. Um, but it's a minimum list. It's what we consider essential. And we expect countries to perhaps adopt quite a lot of that, but to add their own uh, perspective as well. So it's in no way uh, restrictive. Um, last year, um, we also had the uh, Global Research, Innovation and Education on Assistive Technology Summit. Um, and if you like, that was saying, okay, we've got a list. Um, wh where do we go to uh, next with that list? Um, and we have f forthcoming um, publications around policy, products, people, uh, personnel, who you might think of as the providers, and then provision uh, systems. Um, so that was the, the, the meeting again in uh, WHO. And it's important that these meetings certainly happen in WHO because we get the, the buy-in from that organization. But it's actually much more important that these sorts of meetings happen outside uh, WHO in these sorts of contexts, but also in, in various low-income uh, country uh, contexts. So the, the, the next step, uh, if you like, is trying to think about this sort of transformative change. It's a, it's a huge uh, challenge if you think of the 90% who don't uh, have, have access. Um, with this promise of leaving no one behind uh, in the SDGs, 90% of people are being, being left behind. So how can we change the sort of systems and approaches? Um, what we want to look at in, in this symposium are examples of good practices um, for sure, but also the barriers, the very real barriers and how they've been addressed, um, and some of the facilitators, which may be specific to particular uh, contexts. And so looking at certainly context, resources, systems, and cultures. Before we move on to that, I want to get you to think about two things which I think are crucial, if you like, to the, the, the bigger picture. And one is systems thinking. Um, and to try and make this a bit more palatable, uh, I've come up with what I call 10 punishing P's. So 10 things beginning with P. Um, and I want to give you examples of non-system thinking. So I want you to think as I go through these, do the, any of these apply to your practice or your organization or your country? So people. Uh, users have little input to design, delivery, uh, or evaluation. Policy, um, there may be some policies in different departments in, in, in a country, uh, but there's no overall vision across the country and across sectors, and there's no uh, rational resource allocation. Uh, procurement that that is based on the success of certain powerful advocacy groups, um, but not on, let's say, census or national survey data that gives you a more rational uh, basis to make choices. Uh, provision, different products are provided in different locations. So if you need a, a hearing aid, if you need uh, glasses, if you need a prosthesis, you, the user, have to travel to different places uh, for each of these. Uh, products, there may be lots of interesting products, but their development is industry-led um, rather than uh, perhaps more user-focused. Personnel, you might have many different types of specialist practitioners, but they're rather uh, protective of their own professional domain, and they tend to say, this is the sort of thing we do, and something else uh, is the sort of thing another professional group does. Um, the place, uh, this is important because the focus is on the products rather than the, the resources uh, and the processes that can help them be effective within the particular context. Um, place, that people tend to think through what they're already is and it's determined by the existing supply chain and reflects rather sort of linear thinking. 
Um, and then partnership, there may be quite a lot of partnerships, um, but they're reactive and they're rather short term, and they're within the similar sphere. So they may be different producers, or they may be different uh, users, or they may be different service providers, but they're rarely across those different spheres. Um, and then promoting, um, you may have very good promotion for single products, but not promotion for the system that can provide that product, which might include the, uh, the assessment, uh, the, the, f the fitting, the, the maintenance, the evaluation, the feeding it back into um, the development from the, from the user's perspective. So if any of those seem to be familiar, um, does, does anyone feel that none of these are familiar to their own experience? Have we any super duper people? <laughs> okay, well I think certainly from the Irish context, I would say most of these are very characteristic of the Irish context, and we are an enormously rich country uh, compared to many countries. Um, in fact, I don't think any of them for Ireland um, are uncharacteristic uh, of, of us. Um, so I think a systems approach is going to be absolutely essential. Um, and I want to finish off by talking about uh, another concept, which is market shaping. Um, if, if we go out of uh, this building and go into a, a, a pharmacist or drugstore just down the road, the, the likelihood is in, in Austria we will come across um, a stand which has different reading glasses that you can buy off that stand for one or two or three or four euro if you want to be really extravagant. Um, if you go into Lusaka or Le Longui um, or, or wherever, you won't find uh, th these sorts of products um, and you won't find them uh, very often because the people who produce the products do not have a guarantee that they're going to be able to sell them into that market. So in places where they could be exceptionally uh, beneficial, um, there isn't a mechanism, an overall system for providing them. And so this is what people re refer to as market shaping. How do you create a context that allows you to do that? And again, this, this, one, uh, this approach has been used extensively uh, in, in the uh, drug industry in terms of trying to make certain life-saving drugs available uh, to people in the very poorest communities. Um, and so this approach looks at things like research and development and offers prizes in, in that area. It looks at uh, manufacturing um, and procurement. Um, so if you think of procurement, you have tens and possibly hundreds of millions in procurement across uh, the, the donor world. So these are different uh, countries, different civil society organizations and so on by pulling together, getting them to come together and establish agreements about procuring certain types of assistive products, you can have a huge impact in terms of securing uh, supply and relating that to, to real demand. Um, and you can establish distribution networks that are very effective. One of the amazing things they did in drug supply was they said, in Africa, who has the best uh, distribution network and the, the answer, you might not be surprised to know, is Coca-Cola. You go just about anywhere and you can find Coca-Cola. So they actually connected the supply of drugs um, to the supply of a completely different product, a very innovative uh, way of, of looking at, at things. Um, so in terms of service delivery and, and user adoption, uh, they developed sort of policies in these areas that would feed back into um, how things are, are supplied, who actually provides them, um, and then how they're monitored and followed up. And many of these didn't go with conventional um, health professions, but more community-based workers. So f finally, um, the, the approach they use in, in market shaping is to do with um, observing what is the case at the moment. Is it to do with affordability, availability, 
quality assurance, appropriateness or awareness. They go through a, a, a diagnosis process in terms of the market. Um, is it to do with transaction costs? Is it to do with a lack of information? Um, and, and so on. And then they assess these different essential market characteristics and look at different processes for implementation and then, of course, measuring everything so that you can feed back in, particularly the user's perspective in terms of these accessibility uh, A's, as they're called, under ob observe. So these are some of the ways in which I think we need to think more broadly um, about systems uh, approaches um, and also how we shape the, the market for what we do. Within the, the sessions that we're, we're having now, we're open to all questions. I'd ask the presenters to try and keep their presentations to, to round about nine minutes. We have a bit more, more time than we thought uh, initially. Um, and I'd really ask you, as the participants, to help, I guess, shape this discussion so that we can, we can sort of get past the, that's amazing technology, bit to how would we actually make that work in our particular situation um, in terms of resources, demand, supply, uh, and, and so on. So um, I'm going to stop, stop there. And um, I'm going to, uh, having talked about uh, Africa, um, hand over to our African uh, representatives, because we're going to go uh, next to Africa, then we're going to um, go to the, the Middle East uh, with two presentations. And so this first part is Africa and the, the Middle East. Um, we'll then uh, look at uh, some presentations from North America, and we'll end up with presentations from here uh, in Austria. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to um, Kibi Manana and Amanda uh, Gibbard, who are from the South African Department of Transport. Um, they are based in uh, Pretoria, South Africa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, we just want to thank the Zero Project for the opportunity they've given to us um, to share with you um, our experiences with regard to implementation of universal design in public transport. Um, it will be a joint presentation between myself and Amanda. Um, we work for the National Department of Transport. Maybe I must just uh, explain um, what the National Department of Transport does. Um, we are largely a policy development and legislation development. Uh, as well as regulatory um, function uh, department. Uh, so at a national department, we will develop those and at a provincial sphere and municipal sphere, they would then take cue from um, what the national policy says. So we from the National Department of Transport and in 2007, um, we developed the public transport strategy. Um, we were going to host the World Cup 2010 um, and the strategy basically um, required, or rather proposed, two thrusts. Um, the introduction of what we call integrated public transport networks in 13 cities. Um, initially, it was only nine because we were hosting in only nine municipalities. And after the 2010, we then expanded it to cover um, the additional municipalities. And the second thrust of the strategy looked at that we had existing systems, and therefore we need to look at upgrading those systems over time. And a key uh, target in the strategy was to actually have all new systems that we're going to roll out in preparation for 2010 to be 100% universally accessible. Now, after the strategy in 2009, sorry, after the strategy in 2007, we then developed what we call the implementation strategy to guide the provision of accessible public transport systems in South Africa. It had identified universal access um, as a goal as well, and it also largely followed the two thrusts um, of that all new systems must be 100% accessible, and all existing ones must be then um, in an incremental, man incremental manner made accessible. 
In 2012, uh, as a government, we then developed the National Development Plan that seeks to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by 2030. Um, so these are the three um, documents that basically guide the work that we do. Now, the Accessible Public Transport Strategy uh, seeks to implement um, universal access across the travel chain for all new public transport systems, as I said, and this should cover all modes, but largely the work that we're doing focuses on land transport, basically roads as well as rail. With air, um, we, Mamanda will explain, we deal more with uh, complaints that come um, because it's resting in a different um, branch than where we are. And we also then have to monitor and evaluate the implementation of the strategy as a national department. Um, we then identified the need to, to develop universal design standards for all the public transport systems and public spaces and also make these national standards. And when they become national standards, municipalities, the 13 municipalities that we're piloting these IPTNs in, then have to um, <laughs> comply with the standards. And an, an important legacy as well as part of the integrated public transport networks was to actually uh, transform our public spaces um, and make uh, public transport transformation as an important legacy. Um, and the work that we do as well, thirdly, through the public transport strategy is to work with our national NGOs, other government departments, because the work that we do is not only just purely transport, it covers human settlements or housing, it covers um, national treasury, like the funders. And so we continue to interact with those departments and the traveling public. Um, yeah, I think I'll do with that. The innovative aspects of what we're doing, um, we basically then, um, as part of the World Cup 2010, uh, National Treasury had, a, had established a grant to fund the work that we're doing. And beyond 2010, we then got to keep the grant and to basically implement uh, public transport systems using the same grant. And then we took that grant, and within the grant, we then developed a condition, which was not there before, that any municipality that's going to be applying for finance through the grant must fulfill um, universal design principles in, in, in the systems that they um, implement. An additional condition that we also set in was that a municipality will then have to develop a universal design access plan, and, um, and, th and this plan must be part of their um, integrated public transport network plan. And as I said, we're doing this in 13 municipalities. Um, and so those municipalities largely account for nearly 50% of the national population. The impact that it has created, we've seen um, the feedback that we get mostly, uh, people with disabilities who've never traveled before or have never been out of their homes before, they've now started to travel. Another positive impact with this is that we, whereas if you know in terms of apartheid spatial planning, you have residences um, almost 50 to 60 kilometers away from your urban centers or your CBDs. And so we've seen these IPTNs um, linking those cities to areas of work, um, you know, before, whereas that had never happened before. Um, we have people with disabilities taking an interest in the delivery of public transport, involved in transport planning and the development of standards, and we're encouraging municipalities to establish networks with, um, um, with uh, NGOs at their level. Um, and also a critical uh, benefit is municipalities are gaining knowledge uh, in an area that uh, they hadn't, um, were not aware of before. Um, and also what we're finding is we, universal access now is in the agenda of national government. It's now in the agenda of municipal government as well as provincial government. Um, and so we tend to, we, we hope to build further on that. I will hand over to Michelle, to, sorry, to Amanda. Thank you, Kebi. Um, 
just in terms, could you would you just be able to go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, just just to carry on the presentation, um, some successes and and life stories. Um, we've given some data from the different cities, and I'm not going to go into that now. Only to say that we have four operating cities at the moment out of 13, but we hope in the next two years to have 10. That's the plan. So most of them should be operating. Some of them have been doing an awful lot of planning. But I'll come to that in the problem section. Um, but I'd just like to say a little bit about each of the cities because um, they have done, they've all been successes in different ways and it is because of their work that we've won this award. So I don't want to just plough through lots of figures. I want to tell you what they've done. So Reifier was the first system and there's a photo there of um, a group, of, an access group really, who, who I've been working with, um, with the Reifier system in Johannesburg. Um, because they were a high floor BRT system and that was creating problems particularly for curbside boarding because it's incredibly difficult to develop a system, a high floor system when you're going to have curbside boarding and medium boarding in the middle um, of the road. So they're moving towards a low entry system and um, the access group um, are going to be helping them more with that because it's such a massive change in the work that they've been doing. So um, the other thing that I'd just like to say is that some of the work we've done is identifying universal access passengers. So obviously you could say that maybe um, you know 7.5 of the national population has a disability of one sort or another, but we've done some work on looking at the fact that 60% of the population are affected are universal access passengers, especially on public transport. You have women who need safety, you have people carrying luggage, obviously it's public transport. And so if you put all those groups together um, with, with children and um, people who are accompanying children, this, we're actually talking about the minority and what we're dealing with is public transport that has not been designed for the, the, the majority. Um, it's been designed for the minority and what we're doing is trying to shift that in terms of, of the attitude of the people who are, are implementing transport systems. Um, could we go to the next slide, Kippy? Thank you. So just some of the other um, success stories. Um, Tswane has a system called Arieng um, and one of the things that we've been able to prove with them is that um, in doing survey work is that although the national statistic is 7.5% of the population has a disability, if you make the system as accessible as it can be, we found that the, the, the statistic is actually 10% of the population, which probably goes to show that there are a lot of people who can't travel, and once you bring in a system, they can and they do. Um, and some people have been waiting for these buses for 17 years since the Constitution was in introduced and they were told that they were equal and that it's only now that they're beginning to experience it for the first time. Cape Town is the largest geographical system and um, they won an award in 2014 because they were the most accessible system and they won a Zero Project Award for that. So they continue to be one of the flagships and, um, and lead the way. They're being caught up a little bit by George, which is the only system that's made sure that their entire network is accessible. Um, the others, obviously, because they're bigger, um, are having to introduce this incrementally. Um, and George have done the most amazing job with driver training. I mean, one of the parts of this project is to take the um, the minibus taxi industry, which is violent and dangerous as, and has its own um, unique problems. Um, and so they've done a huge amount with driver training, which is quite a remarkable success story. You have the next slide, please, Kibby. So just in terms of some of the problems, I've written quite a, an extensive list of problems and I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, but one of the big issues is standards. Um, universal access standards, um, they're not thorough enough and they're not detailed enough. So we're doing some work to, to change that in public transport and public space. But one of the difficulties that we found is that there's this insidious relationship with apartheid and that goes into the training of professionals. And it means that it's very difficult to change the standards and to change people's minds about the standards and what they want to achieve. 
So it's, it's a historical problem and it's going to take a long time to shift that and you have to take everyone with you. So that's a process that you have to um, uh, introduce and it has a knock-on effect on costs because there's a tendency to do everything wrong first and then ask for more money to put it right. And that creates, it's just such a waste. Um, and it's very frustrating. Um, and it's also professional teams have never been taught this, so they don't know. So there's also just a natural tendency to fall back on, on what they do know, which is what we're, we're trying to get away from. And this issue of silo thinking, so we come across with a, we, along with a, a disruptive and radical thinking idea, and what people want to do is just go back into their silos because they're really fed up with radical and disruptive thinking, and so they go back to something which is the old way of doing things, which is apartheid planning and is completely wrong. And so those kind of things are very difficult to change, and that's one of the things that we struggle with and why we're surprised that we won an award, that we've been able to make any difference whatsoever. Just to go on to the next slide, Kibby. Thank you. So our next steps is, is really to align what we're doing with the sustainable development goals and to look at geographical transformation, which in the history of the country, um, and as a Brit who came with, you know, we come with our, all our, our colonial baggage, is really exciting to be involved in, to be making this geographical dis difference in cities. Um, and so that's one of the things that we need to do. We need to translate policy into practice and build on the alliances that we have made. Everybody is talking about universal access now and two of the exciting things that happened before we came are differences in the aviation sector and the rail sector which means that people actually really want to start moving on this. Um, and to do this in the context of existing disability rights legislation and to help municipal government be more responsive to its dis residents with disabilities. Um, and we are doing that in, through developing indicators to try and get municipalities to be more self-monitoring. And we need to re revisit our accessible transport strategy and see how that can help. I think that may be the end of our presentation. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and thank you for being part of success. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kibi and uh, Amanda. I think what we'll do is we'll just see if there's any points of clarification and if not, we'll try and hold the, the questions to the end of each of the uh, sessions so we can have a more general discussion. Is there any quick point of clarification? No, obviously very, very clear. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to uh, move directly on. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mukhtar Al Shabani, who is from the from uh, Gates. So this is uh, they do more than Gates because they have another A and they have an S. Um, but they are the Global Alliance on Accessible Technologies uh, and Environments and they have been doing uh, terrific work for a number of years, indeed long before GATE uh, was established. So really looking forward to uh, hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. First, I will start with something related to GATE. When we uh, took the, the initiative of GAATS, uh, we were at that time uh, thinking of uh, a famous name in the world. And so that's why we put A extra. So one day I was in Dubai and I was in a meeting with uh, Prince Charles of UK. And I say hello, uh, hello, Mokhtar Al Shibani from Gates. Oh, say hello to Bill. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, Bill Gates. <laughs> we, are, we are Gates only. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So uh, I will start with uh, 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 some talking about the Gulf vision. The Gulf consists of six uh, countries, Saudi Arabia, the largest, Oman, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, and Kuwait. Uh, to start with uh, Gates, uh, I'm one of the founders of Gates 10 years ago, 
And we celebrated last June our 10 years anniversary at the UN together with the UNCRPD in the same time. So uh, when we established GATE in Canada and Ottawa, we uh, concentrate on three things, build environment, mobility, access, uh, ICT. So these are the three components which is the major of the uh, accessibility issues are related to, plus tourism is one of the, our main goals also, access to tourism. So um, we, at that time, we work with uh, all of the UN uh, governmental, I mean, agencies like UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, UN Habitat, uh, World Bank, and many other organizations around the world. So it's a gate is a global organization, and uh, now exists in more than 30, 40 countries around the world. So uh, we gave yesterday some history of gates. But let me just see, because of the time, on the next slide, uh, uh, the purpose of the presentations, first is to a brief introduction about the speakers, organizations, and background, which is, I just spoke about it now. The second is uh, review uh, some of the major universal accessibility project in the region, the Gulf region. And third is the presentation, some of the results, impacts of the project. So these are the three elements that we are going to talk about. So Gates, as I said, number one is you know the, uh, the Global Alliance on Accessible Technology and Environment. And I have I created my own office 30 years ago called Al Mudun in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh and in Dubai. Uh, mainly working in access consultancy in the region as an architect and specialized in access consultancy. So we are there for the last 30 years in, uh, in the region of uh, the Middle East region. Uh, so next uh, I will talk about one of the, our latest projects that we uh, just completed. Uh, Dubai is going to host the 2020 uh, uh, Expo. And they are expecting more than 60 million visitors for six months. Uh, and uh, they asked the gate to look at the accessibility situation in the city. Uh, we had a team of 25 experts uh, and we done an intensive work to uh, within the methodology of the work we complete uh, uh, analysis of the uh, gap analysis uh, in the city itself because Dubai is uh, who had visited Dubai raise his hand please one two three four five six seven I invite you the others to visit Dubai by the way you should go don't just stay in Vienna. Uh, it's a beautiful city, but when it was planned, I mean, the accessibility issue was not in the radar at that time. So it's had a very fast, tremendous development. High-rise buildings and many shopping malls and many other facilities around. So we done a gap analysis for the whole city to find out there are some pockets which are accessible, but many others are not. Uh, we we were looking to the two things: build environment and mobility and intersections and roads and others. Then we develop a strategy for the city. Uh, of course, there was more than 40 stakeholders with us, working with us uh, all the time. And uh, weekly we have uh, presentations to, uh, to see what exactly we can do. Uh, we develop a universal accessibility code for the city, which was the first uh, of kind, or the latest actually in the world, because we have, uh, Gate had uh, an an analysis of all the codes around the world 
and we are also part of the ISO uh, standard committee TC59 subcommittee 16 dealing with uh, standardization and developing the uh, the accessibility standard in the built environment so based on that we develop the the code it's been distributed uh, to the stakeholders to see their comments and uh, find out what the, are their comment and what's missing there. The development of universal accessibility code, after that we had conducted training program. Because unless we train the engineers and the architects and the planners, nothing will happen. Because, you know, they are 80% the key to the accessibility issue. Their minds are, they did not study the accessibility issue, they just, you know, they had not studied in, in schools and, uh, and they, it is not in their mind and if they saw a person with disability, they may say, well, he's there, we don't see them in the street. The streets are not accessible, the pavement are not accessible, the buildings are not accessible. So how come you want to, you will see them uh, in the in the in the in the road. Uh, then we had some pilot projects that we done in the in the city uh, to uh, be sure that the code itself is really uh, imp can be implemented, especially on the metro, on the stations, bus stations, in in in. Um, hotels, uh, uh, parks, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, and many other facilities there, there are, uh, we had uh, to, uh, to uh, make some pilot studies to find out. The project was completed last year, and uh, now uh, the government of Dubai had uh, uh, gave the compulsory uh, royal degree to all, 10 of the governmental agencies to implement it directly with a budget before the 2020. Uh, Ministry of Health, Education, Recreation, Municipality, Mosques, and uh, other uh, governmental bodies. The next thing is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Universal Accessibility Project and Case Study for 2030 Vision Project uh, successfully closed. That project which we conduct with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was to look at the, in how to implement the Universal Accessibility in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, within the vision of the 2030. Uh, again, we had a good team to work in this project with the Ministry of Planning and the Economy, and we had uh, uh, conducted a thorough study with uh, different ministries especially health, education, transportation, social affairs, uh, ICT, uh, Ministry of ICT, and uh, Ministry of uh, Labor. So these ministries, we, there were seven ministers in, involved in this uh, project that we had uh, studied, and uh, we uh, raised to them the importance of the universal accessibility and we uh, define to them uh, uh, the gaps which is happening in Saudi Arabia. Actually, we are behind, I have to say that. Uh, Dubai is more advanced, but we had an agreement with the UN Habitat to develop uh, or make strategies for 17 cities in Saudi Arabia. And Unfortunately, the universal accessibility was not part of the UN Habitat vision. And I have to say it because uh, 
uh, we engaged and the UNDISA had the workshop in Nairobi with the UN Habitat to raise the UN the accessibility, universal accessibility to them, to their mind, to their vision. So unfortunately they did not apply this in it, but we catch up and we ask the government to include the universal accessibility as part of this development. Of course we receive in Saudi Arabia 30 million are expected 2030 to come yearly to Mecca and Medina as an Islamic cities. And we have now negotiations with the municipality of Mecca and municipality of Medina to uh, conduct and to uh, to uh, implement uh, the, universal, the universal accessibility in these two holy cities. Um, initial strategy draft and implementations were set in this program and uh, we are waiting uh, for His Royal Highness to make a decision when uh, the next step has to be taken and uh, we, are look we are waiting for this in 2018. Actually, it's, uh, it's not far away. Uh, there are two things that in the strategy. First is the quick wins. What are the quick wins that can be done immediately and what are the things which is a long run things. To change, the quick win is to implement universal accessibility in any new project. That is a must. The second thing is, the long project is to change the build environment to, to be an, an accessible environment, accessible, uh, accepted, you know, humanitarian and uh, I need to be there. Major thing is in the quick win is training. We have to settle a training program for the engineers, architect, planners from the beginning. We have uh, more than 130,000 engineers and architects in the country and we start up by training them. The third thing is health environment because uh, we are now in the WHO uh, session, the health environment universal accessibility project for Saudi Arabia for the Ministry of Health and Education and uh, uh, the final stage uh, approval. We met with the Ministry of Health and we discussed with them the implementation of universal accessibility. Five minutes, there is no red signal today. Uh oh, it's not working. Okay, I have to take my time then. There is no traffic light here. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to India. So, the Ministry of Health, two minutes or one minute? Two minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, the Ministry of Health has um, uh, uh, in charge of all the hospitals in the, in the country and uh, unfortunately universal accessibility was not in the radar of this ministry. So we met with the, high, uh, the minister and all the deputy ministers and we had uh, conducted uh, training program for the engineers developing a uh, U-Health code, gap analysis study for existing codes and uh, large hospitals, medium and small, and develop a strategy and conducting uh, consultation studies for uh, pilot programs that we are going to do this year. Then uh, finally, I think it's uh, smart cities of, at um, all KSA Vision 2030 project for uh, Saudi Ministry of uh, communication and information, ICT. Again, we have the, set up with them a program for a quick win, what can be done in 2018 and what will be done to, to reach 2030. Lastly, I think is uh, train transportation uh, environment. Uh, with the Ministry of Transportation, we met with them and we discussed uh, all type of problems, uh, conducting uh, training program and uh, developing UA transportation code. Actually, we have a code in 2000, uh, uh, five years ago, 2014, 12, sorry. 
we had four codes, build environment, mobility, tourism, and uh, we are now updating these codes. But the implementation was not there. Now, the things that has been changed. Uh, gap analysis and developing a strategy. Now, the last thing is the, the positive uh, shift in pact of the uh, mentioned project. We have first the government uh, complete uh, comment, commitment for the cause and uh, decision makers position res response and more public awareness was going to be. Thank you for all and I hope I kept the time. Thank you very much. Okay, so for our um, fourth, fourth uh, speaker of uh, this part, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jean uh, Judes from the uh, Beit Issy Shapiro uh, organization uh, in Israel. Over to Thank you, Jean. You. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just gave a lecture in another session, so I feel like I'm falling into something. I haven't got the context, so excuse me if I you can't connect 100% correctly. Um, but um, I would like to, you know, first of all, I'd like to thank the WHO. Chapal is not here. Thank you. I know how involved you are in leadership. Um, uh, uh, one of our leaders at Beit Izzy Shapiro was at your meeting in Geneva. And so we feel very connected to what you are trying to lead. And I thought that I'd like to speak about three main barriers that we are facing in Israel. Um, in terms of assistive technology and kind of what the plans are, at least at Beit Easy, but also beyond um, how to, to try and address them. So I'd like to start off by saying that Israel is a very, very uh, digital savvy country um, with a very vibrant um, high tech community, um, as well as we have a very vibrant third sector. Um, in fact, it's so vibrant that there are probably about seven different non-profit organizations working on AT at the same time. So, um, you know, this is such an opportunity on the one hand, but as we say in Hebrew, it's a balagan, it can be a huge mess um, on the other. And I think one of our very um, big challenges is um, to say how do we have this, the, the good interest, the good opportunities within our, 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 our society, in our business sector, in our nonprofit sector, and try and make something more systematic and um, have more policy, okay, around AT. Um, so the first thing that we'd like to do, and the WHO I know is very much looking for countries to do, is to try and do a mapping of the needs, um, what exists in assistive technology. I mean, no one has this information in Israel. And um, what exists in assistive technology? Um, what government departments are doing what? It's, we have a very fragmented situation where different uh, government departments are giving different kinds of pieces of AT. And, um, you know, and there's no uh, information that's in, in one place. What are those criteria for giving people um, AT um, in Israel, as I, I would imagine in many other countries, when there are strong parent lobby groups, then you will find um, AT for those groups, but it's not because it comes from a macro policy level. It's coming more just from a, you know, different um, um, groups that you know lobby for their p the particular cause. Um, so um, you know that's that's something else we see. Um, in terms of the procurement procurement um, processes, you know it's, it can be very um, difficult for people with disability to access because there are all sorts of committees and so on. So you know how can we simplify and make it more respectful um, on, on how to get um, the AT that you need. Um, how do you train the professionals um, um, to, to, give, to um, give a better service and um, etc. Et et so um, what we would like to do, uh, what we are trying to do, is to try and do a macro map of, this, of what is happening in Israel. There's policy and there's practice and, how, and there's a huge gap between those two things, and how do we influence policy, and how do we close the gap? So, you know, that's the first issue that we're looking at. 
The second issue that we're looking at at BAIT, Izzy Shapiro and many of our other colleagues, and we obviously in dialogue with government and so on, is the issue of the professionals. You know, I'm, we are members of the gate community, and one of the things that we hear so often is the fact that professionals aren't experts on AT means that we know only 10% of people get AT, um, you, know, you know, out of you know, those that need it. So, you know, um, how do we um, um, really train our professionals um, to, um, about the use of AT, what exists, how to help their um, users um, uh, be aware of what's on the market and so on. Um, the problem, of course, is that assistive technology is changing so quickly, you know, in this, this world of, you know, um, technology expertise, um, knowledge that's relevant one day, you know, um, six months later, um, something else has come on the market. So, you, so one really does have to think um, about how, if you do do training, because I know there's training in, in many other countries, um, but if you do do it, how do you keep the professionals up to date and in sync um, with what exists? So that's the second issue that we're thinking of, and we have been influenced by our dialogue in the gate community. Um, I think um, the third issue that we're looking at um, is really looking at um, the third barrier which, which we, we identify is, um, um, you know, how do you also uh, make sure that products, are, and, the, and this we hear all the time, are, um, can be developed that um, are um, accessible also financially as well as to all different groups of disabilities and so on. And, um, you know, we've done a few things in Israel to try and address this. So one of the things that we've done is we've worked with Google um, to um, um, train the app developers on different kinds of disabilities and how when they make mainstream um, um, software, how it can be made accessible for different groups from the beginning. So how do you um, educate um, the technology experts um, to, to understand accessibility? How do you give them the tools? People with different disabilities were um, the mentors um, of uh, um, this training and um, what we heard from um, the different um, companies, uh, their um, products at the end were much better for everybody. And that's what we um, were really pleased about. You know, maybe some of you know Waze, which is a mainstream um, a program so you can get from one place to another. Um, their um, software developer came to this training. They, make way, they made ways um, accessible, more, uh, more accessible, much more accessible. And they said to us afterwards that you know the, the great part was that you know they, they were getting good feedback on what this had done for their product in general. So that the, so the first um, you know issue is how do you um, you know not only train professionals but how do you um, train the people making um, you know the mainstream um, 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 software and so on in our digital world. The other thing that we did um, was we set up a, an, an accelerator pro, pro, uh, project for um, the development of assistive technology. Um, um, and, you know, there are many, many accelerator projects in Israel today, but there was none on disabilities and assistive technology. Because what we wanted to do was to educate the ecosystem um, about, um, you know, educate the entrepreneurs, ed educate the investors, educate government, um, all the different stakeholders um, about the importance of the development of that wonderful knowledge we have in the country, but how do you use it f to develop products for people with disabilities? So we set up an accelerator project to support entrepreneurs who wanted to develop um, um, assistive technology for people with disabilities. And there's been quite an explosion um, of developments, I think, here at the Zero Project last year and this year, and quite a few were showcased. Um, in our accelerator project, I'm very proud to say that we've had 45 different entrepreneurs going through it, um, of which 40% have already got invest investments. They're well on their way. Um, and they've won prizes and competitions, and six have already reached the international marketplace. 
So um, now the many entrepreneurs that are also doing wonderful things in Israel that don't go through our accelerator, they don't need it. Um, you know, we are more for those um, really beginners, you know, to get them interested to come into the world. So. Um, we, we found that giving the supports um, has been very useful. Um, but you know, our next, um, you know, our next goal really is to think: if we want people to be updated on assistive technology, it's not enough to train and so on and so forth, because it's such a fast-moving area, and you can't only look at your own country. We're trying to look at the issue of how do we build a di digital platform. Um, we're doing, looking at this with Ashoka, um, and um, for those, if there's anyone here in the um, Ashoka team, um, but we, and with Zero Project, we're looking at it, and with other partners, and if anyone here is interested to be, to be part of a digital platform, we invite you, because we think that people who are developing AT um, should be speaking to each other, entrepreneurs within a country and between countries, there's so much duplication. Um, you know, um, I think we even see here, there's so many people working today, everyone from a different point of view, but on, for example, on, ma on um, you know, mapping and so on and so forth, and I think there are about three companies, um, each one worthy in the, their own way, and they're different countries, so they have different kind of products, but how do we get people to uh, collaborate more um, across countries on development, it will make it cheaper and, and also more universally um, significant for other people. And we, we feel that you have to do it on a digital platform with investors and entrepreneurs and, uh, and so on and so forth, all the, all the, 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 the relevant professionals, experts, um, can really dialogue with each other and share what's happening and maybe um, work together. And even if they compete, at least they know they're not inventing the wheel and not doing things in parallel. So I just chose to bring those three barriers, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, well, I think your presentation was so complimentary to mine, people would think uh, we were practicing uh, really? before. <laughs> So we, we've had uh, the, this idea of uh, fragmentation and uh, working with policy and, and professions, etc., et and entrepreneurship from uh, Israel, and then the, the idea of a gap analysis and a, a, a very nice process for uh, strategically addressing uh, that gap and particular implementation uh, projects from uh, Dubai. And then also the, the notion of uh, transport, um, actually when it's for the majority, and the majority of people actually have a range of what we used to call special needs. Um, and so I often hear people talking about transport for the minority, but I think you persuaded me that uh, actually the majority includes pe people who it's not designed for, and there are people with a range of different needs uh, in, in South Africa. So three very uh, interesting, different, but complementary perspectives. So we have a few minutes now for some questions. Um, so I'm hoping you have some uh, difficult questions for our presenters. Can you raise your hand if you have a, a question, please? Yes, please, sir, at the back. Yeah. Hi there, my name is Ian McKinnon. Uh, quick question uh, for Mukhtar uh, regarding the work in, in Dubai. It sounds uh, really exciting, um, clearly made a lot of progress over a relatively short period of time. Um, my question is about how you uh, have done and, and plan to, to capture all those engineers, architects and planners with the training. How, you, know, you said there were 130,000 of them, so how, how do you capture them? Uh, okay, the 130,000 in Saudi Arabia. So we had with the Engineering Com uh, Association for the engineers, uh, we have uh, programs for them. But in Dubai, uh, we, because of the time is short and a quick win, we uh, train the trainers. Uh, in each uh, ministry or governmental body, we took the engineers who are uh, uh, designated for in the implementation, we train them and they do the training for the other, you know, uh, participant at, at that ministry. So last, uh, two weeks ago, the, the municipality had one week for uh, universal accessibility uh, for the, uh, both for the engineers and for the 
consultants working in Dubai, contractors working in Dubai, and uh, suppliers. So uh, it was a, a full week uh, orientation to them about the program. So the government is doing a great job and great work uh, to implement what we had uh, achieved. Thank you. Another question? Okay, I, well, I have a question for our South African uh, presenters. So you were, you were mentioning that the, um, the system as it's designed, um, I think, in Cape Town was seven years old, whereas in Tiswani and George it was about two and a half years old. So I'm just, just wondering, what's the challenges uh, around changing a transport system that's r relatively older versus one that, that's more new, or is it the same? Thank you. Um, I think the older systems, I mean, the older system is, is rail. You know, that's, that's, and I think that one of the issues is all, most rail systems, the historical ones in the world, were designed before you even considered the fact that people with disabilities might want to use it. Uh, most rail systems, old ones, are inaccessible. Um, and so you have to have a different approach. You need a longer term plan. Um, and you need one that people can say that they can actually do it. So, you, you know, it's, it's pointless coming up with deadlines that are they're, they're just not achievable. And, um, you know, when money is tight and budgets are tight, um, you have to be very careful about the sort of pressure that you put on and uh, just, just to make sure that people can see success. Um, I think one of the things that I've come to realize is that the need for special transport comes largely because cities have not been planned properly. And in developing countries, the biggest need is around responsive planning. Developing countries have a, a big issue around you know, developers and private companies who will just move in and tell government what is needed. And so there's a huge need for government to be able to stand up and say, actually, we have a plan, and yes, you're welcome to develop, but you need to do this. And if you look at the countries that have been successful in upgrading their systems and services, they're the ones with, with, with regulation. It's not the lack of regulation that causes, a, a, um, that makes things accessible. It's, it's having the right kind of regulation that makes things accessible. And that's one of the reasons why South Africa has been able to achieve a level of success, however difficult. Um, and while I agree with the points that have been made on um, training, I think the other issue is getting government to measure itself. So in bringing in a plan, you need to be able to monitor what you're achieving and how you're achieving. So the development of indicators becomes very important. And so I think you just need to be realistic about what you can do and over what time period. Kibi, I don't know whether you'd like to add anything. Thank you. Um, I think it comes without saying all new investments, um, it's easy to do uh, because you, um, you are committing to, to, to build something and therefore it becomes easy and everybody then uh, becomes interested in that, um, that new flagship project that you have. Whereas old systems um, are difficult in the sense that um, you, have also, you have people staying very far away from your, from your workplaces and some of them are just not willing to actually move um, to new places where you, know, you may have transit-oriented developments that are more like that would make your public transport more effective. Um, so you have to deal with matters of culture where somebody will say um, we've lived in that area for all our life, our grandparents are there, our mothers are there. So it becomes difficult, it's not just as easy. Um, and, and therefore, even in those old areas, you still need to come up with new systems which then make it more um, expensive and costly because you still have to maintain people living in those long distances um, and bringing them into you know into town so it, it comes with its own challenges I don't think it's just an easy way to say um, with new systems it's easier or older systems is more difficult each option comes with 
uh, certain implications that make it easy or more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, then, Jean, just in one minute, you alluded to um, challenges with uh, professions and their, their roles with assistive technology, and maybe there's different ways. In one minute, can you... What can, do you mean by that? What, what, what are the roles in terms of um, fractured services that you were talking about? How can professions address these? You know, you know, what's happening is that we have our Ministry of Health, okay, where you have professionals more from the health um, um, sector. And then we have our welfare uh, ministry with more social workers and, and, and other kinds of professions. So, um, you know, how do you get um, like a transdisciplinary, um, you know, making all the different disciplines and professionals, okay, up to date and up to speed because different professionals have contact with um, different, um, you know, consumers. So how do you um, um, how do you inform them? How can they become committed to uh, becoming experts in, in in AT and knowing what's available and helping their clients navigate um, the system yeah. well? Okay, thank you, thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, um, I wasn't going to have any more questions, but if it's very quick, it's really. Uh, a question that um, I had after hearing your 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 presentation and and uh, the one of Jan, um, uh, and it it really relates on on finding a way to to get your to, to get your views on finding a way to to, to address a solution. I mean, um, I see that. Okay, you have now created this priority list which could help to, 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 to raise more awareness and focus on something. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is my, my, my question to you. Assistive technology is really, um, n especially now that we accessibility is really increasing in the mainstream, is really about um, that personalization choice, um, individual, specific uh, need. Now, um, I see that you know having a very general list and the way in which in which that can uh, move forward, also in in, in Europe, uh, you know where okay this is we, we hear regularly from the user you know I have to choose from a list that's not what I want I want something else I need that particular thing and then that is very much linked um, to the whole um, service provision like you know. Uh, training the individual, training the, 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 the uh, service provider, maintenance, asking questions. So, I, I and then having the, the, the setting so that the user can try things, can can um, um, have some some trials, prove things for a period, come back, readjust the technology. You know, really more the personalization thing. And while I see that, you know, okay, yes, it has a role. It's not to criticize that, but how do we bridge that gap? I mean, how do you, how do you see that evolving? Because, um, okay, we can have hundreds of products, but, you know, people basically who, who start uh, having changing needs and, and, and so forth would, would not know which product to use. They would not know how to choose the list. Is that list suitable for them? All these questions I have, the personalization, the, the accompanying the person in their, in their use of those uh, sophisticated technologies. How do we go about that? Okay, th that's a great question and um, it deserves a longer answer than I'm going to be able to give <laughs> to it just because of time. But, um, so I would agree, on the one hand you have the absolute necessity of personalization. Otherwise, you know, technology doesn't work unless it's, it's personalized to people's uh, individual needs. On the other hand, you have uh, a, a lack of, of components of products which are not available in many very low-income settings. So we must try and create a system where you can have large-scale procurement, which includes a, a variety of different products and sub-components of those products that allow you to develop that sort of personalization. Um, so I, th I think that the idea from, from Gate is uh, n not just to, if you like, flood markets with certain types of products and, and nothing else, but rather with uh, a, a choice and variety of products and subcomponents of products that allow for that sort of interoperability, um, that allow for uh, local providers to provide very personalized services. Um, 
So I think just in the interest of time, I have to, but I'd be happy to talk to you to more, more separately could about I it because I think one, it is a, a, a key issue. One word. One word. <laughs> just to say that, and I'll also speak to you about it afterwards, there is a company in Israel that's developing um, um, very um, sophisticated matching of people's needs and what, um, you know, what they may, you know, what product they may be. So afterwards, I'd be happy um, to share that with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we're just going to finish this panel and move on to the North American panel very uh, swiftly. So if I could just thank um, all the, the presenters from this panel, would you join me in thanking them, please? And uh, if you could take your seats again, and if we could have our three North American presenters uh, come and join us here, please. Okay, so um, we had uh, Jean who came from just being double booked and now Mary is sort of double booked and is about to shoot off to another session after doing this uh, presentation. Um, so moving to a very different uh, context, it's going to be interesting to see what, what uh, similarities and, and differences there, there are in terms of the challenges. So it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Mary uh, Barta Lomucci, Very good. and um, she is from the uh, Creating an Accessible um, Ontario uh, Initiative and from the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario. Mary. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you. And my apologies for having to scoot out just after 12 today uh, to go to another session. Um, I'm so very happy and so very privileged to be here today um, to talk about the work that we're doing in Ontario. But first off, I'd like to thank the Zero Project and the ESSO Foundation for the award that was presented to the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario last night. It's, it's quite an honour uh, to share that award with my colleagues back in Ontario. In 2005, my province of Ontario and Canada introduced a bold and innovative vision which is called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or what we call the AODA. It built on existing legislation, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, that applied only to the Ontario government and to the broader public sector, such as hospitals and municipalities. The AODA applies to all organizations in all sectors, public, private, and not-for-profit, with one or more employees. And that totals about over 400,000 organizations in Ontario. This legislation was, and still is, quite groundbreaking. It requires public and private sector organizations to train their staff on accessibility. That is how to provide services to people with disabilities and the requirements of Ontario's accessibility standards. Just so that you know, we use the word standards in our, in our, uh, a lot in our work on the AODA, but they are in fact regulation. We just use the words interchangeably. It requires regular online accessibility reporting for organizations with 20 or more employees. And it was the first jurisdiction in Canada with legislation that sets out a clear goal and a time frame to meet that goal. Accessibility in the areas that most impact the daily lives of people with disabilities by 2025. And finally, the AODA established the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario, which is the organization where I work in, as a government office to develop and implement accessibility standards, to provide public education tools and resources to help organizations understand and comply with the requirements, oversee and monitor compliance and, and enforcement, and support the regular reviews of the AODA and of its standards. 
The Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation, or the Umbrella Regulation, what we call the IASR, aims to remove accessibility barriers in five key areas of daily life. The Customer Service Standard helps remove barriers for people with disabilities so they can access goods, services, and facilities. And when I mean by facilities, I mean by conference facilities or banquet halls, that kind of facilities. The Information and Communication Standard helps organizations make their information accessible to people with disabilities. The Transportation Standard makes it easier for everyone to travel in Ontario on public transportation. The Accessibility, sorry, the Accessible Employment Standard makes hiring and employee support practices more equitable. And the Design of Public Spaces Standard helps organizations make new and redevelop public areas accessible. This last standard works together with the Ontario Building Code, which is administrated by another ministry in Ontario government, which regulates the accessibility inside buildings. There are over 200 requirements under the OODA and the standards. The majority of those requirements have been phased in over the past 10 years, and the remaining requirements will take effect by 2021. I should note that the Ontario government always goes first. We implement the standards first, and then it's followed by the broader public sector, and then followed by the private sector. The, government, the Ontario government does not provide funding to the businesses or organizations to meet their obligations under the AODA. Instead, the Accessibility Director provides free tools and resources to help organizations meet their legal requirements, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. The, the AODA and the ISR have four key characteristics. First, broad public consultation. This approach to developing the AODA and the regulation was and still continues to be inclusive and consensus-based. The five accessibility standards were developed by standards development committees, and half of those committees are made up of people with disabilities and representatives of employer groups and economic centers uh, for, that have responsibility for that standard make up the other half. The Ontario government staff, like myself, sit in as observers. Broad public consultation was also a major part of the development of all the standards. Oh, I'm going to go back to that one. Okay. Secondly, flexible requirements. The requirements of the standards have been phased in over time to give organizations time to integrate accessibility into their regular business planning so that investments are spread over a number of years. The government is aware that a one-size-fits-all approach may not work for all organizations, so requirements and compliance timelines vary depending on an organization's type and size. The third characteristic is continuous review and improvement. The AODA is unique because it includes requirements to continuously review and improve the Act and its standards. Each accessibility standard is reviewed five years after it becomes law to determine whether it is working as intended and if any adjustments are needed. And those reviews are also conducted by standard development committees. An appointed Accessibility Standards Advisory Council advises the government on the progress of the Standards Development Committees. And additionally, the AODA is assessed, every, the AODA itself, the Act, is assessed every three years by a government appointed expert reviewer who may recommend adjustments to the Act. I can tell you this year and last year we're in a very, very heavy review cycle with many standards being reviewed as well as the Act. The final characteristic is a very progressive approach to compliance and enforcement. We emphasize education and providing resources to help organizations understand and be compliant with the law by conducting public outreach and through a dedicated government help desk. The foundation of our compliance efforts starts with the organization submitting a self-certified accessibility report on a scheduled basis. 2017, last year, was the first year that all sectors government, broader public sector, and the private sector reported in the same year. The Accessibility Directorate then conducts audits to ensure that organizations are meeting their obligations and complying with the law. And while we have a progressive approach to compliance, focusing on awareness and improvement, we are also very committed to enforcing the Act, and we use all available resources to ensure organizations are complying with the law. I spoke earlier of public engagement, a key cornerstone to the AODA and the standards. 
The AODA requires municipalities with 10,000 or more people to form accessibility advisory committees. These are citizen-based committees where at least half of the members are, are people with disabilities. They advise municipal governments on how to improve accessibility in their local communities and take part in the planning of projects to make that happen. These photos show members of different accessibility advisory committees celebrating their accessibility successes from the installation of electric wheelchair, charging stations and parks, to public art, to what we call Mobi mats that let people who use mobility devices navigate beaches and access the water's edge. And they're very proud of the work that they do, as you can note by the accessible Brent flag. They are very proud of the work that they've done as, uh, and their commitment to inclusion um, and accessibility. In addition to developing and implementing the AODA, a key function of the Accessibility Directorate is educating organizations on how to comply with Ontario's accessibility laws. We do this through community accessibility forums, webinars, presentations, outreach booths at summer festivals, and professional conferences. And we realize we cannot make change alone, we cannot do this alone, and that for culture change to happen, many partnerships are needed. The Ontario government offers a funding program to educate various industries or sectors on accessibility laws. And on this slide, you'll note a number of organizations that have taken advantage of our Enabling Change program, which is, provides financial support to leaders in not-for-profit organizations to educate their stakeholders about accessibility. The slide shows the logos of some of the organizations, and you'll see Gates uh, on this slide as well. Um, that we worked with on over 150 projects covering sectors such as retail, trucking, tourism, culture, hospitality, and um, libraries. These images show different resources produced by enabling change partner organizations, and they include free online training website on Ontario's accessibility standards to help organizations meet the law's training requirements, a mental health accessibility training website for physical activity providers, a guide to accessible film festivals and screening, and a video on creating accessible recreation facilities for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. So what's next for Ontario and for the AODA and the ISR? It's been 13 years since the AODA became law and we've made a lot of progress. In 2015 and last year in 2017, we used large ath athletic events such as the Pan and Parapan American Games and the Invictus Games as catalysts to, show, to showcase Ontario's accessibility accomplishments and maintain momentum. In addition to the work that is underway in reviewing the information communications, the employment and the transportation standards, two new standards development committees are now developing accessibility standards in healthcare and in education. The government has also just appointed its third reviewer for the review of the AODA this past month. We will continue to implement a provincial employment strategy for people with disabilities and by connecting more people with disabilities to job opportunities and businesses to talent, this strategy will help us grow a stronger Ontario economy and a diverse culture of acceptance. But there's still much more work to do. Uh, we're always working hard to achieve that goal. The real challenge will be continuing to work with organizations to move beyond the accessibility requirements, the minimum standards in the ISR to truly build a culture of accessibility and inclusion as we work towards the goal of Ontario, of an accessible Ontario by 2025. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, any quick question of clarification? Before we move on, no. Um, okay, so um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Sophie uh, Langton from Society Logique, um, and she's going to talk about universal design walkability uh, audit again in the Canadian context. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm. My name is uh, so I'm. A urban planner and executive director at Society Logic. Uh, first of all, I want to, to thank uh, Zero Project for the opportunity to share with you our latest tool, the Universal Design Walkability Audit, PPASAU. We will have to find a, an, a new name for that, but today it's the name. <laughs> 
the, and uh, for selected at one of the uh, 2018 innovative practices. I think you uh, you understand my disability today is English. <laughs> my first language is French. I will try to do my best. Okay, uh, may I add? Uh, This one? Okay. No, the other one? Yeah, the other one. Uh, some word about Société Logique. Société Logique is a non-profit organization and social enterprise founded in 1981 in Montreal, Canada, uh, in Quebec province, East province of Ontario, uh, by a group of professional living with disabilities. Currently hiring a team of 10 universal design consultants, almost urban planners and architects. Our mission is to promote and participate into the development of living environments that are accessible to all citizens. The Audit PPASAU is our new tool. It's a new observational tool available since the fall of 2016 that evaluates whether street characteristics are good and safe for our pedestrians. Its initial mandate was to design a systematic observation grid of the built environment that supports active transportation and integrates universal accessibility indicator. The, there's an issue in, uh, in Montreal and I think in uh, most uh, city of North America, trends of walkability, public health, active mobility, active design, um, pedestrian path, uh, cyclist, and it's generally not include need of people with disability, aging people, and zero five year children. We have to put in place something for their needs are included in the beginning of the put in place this, these trends. Then PPA SAU is our solution for that. PPA, how we change that? PPASAU includes several universal design criteria divided into five categories of determinants for evaluating urban environment safety and accessibility in favor, in favor of healthy lifestyle, autonomy, and social participation. The tool makes systematic and objective observation on a micro scale uh, such as pathways, crossing, intersection, public transit, and facilities. No? Oh, okay, I have to push two times. Sorry. Next one? Okay. The audit have more than 100 reliable and scientifically proven indicators designed to quantify the performance in universal accessibility with simple observation, such as the presence of absence of a list item on a form. Collected data is compiled into a database, overcoming the lack of reliable information on pedestrian environments. It's important for, for us. It's a, data quantify and uh, objective. It's not subjective data like uh, exploratory uh, works. We use this data to make diagnostic and portraits of the environment. And it's the funny part of the thing, uh, to mix uh, all uh, this uh, 100 data and find uh, the things uh, the, the thing that appear for us, their problems, and after the solution. The resulting diagnostic portraits can take shape in uh, different visual formats designed to support evidence-based decision-making for public authorities. The audit allows to evaluate proportion of an observer, observed trajectory that are in good condition, as well to identify specifically which part are problematic, compile beneficial intervention of the public domain. Every. 
The project was carried out in collaboration with a number of experts from senior and ad disability advocacy organization, rehabilitation, public health professional, architect, and mus municipal urban planners. PPASAU is the first objective method to collect accurate data during the usual exploratory walks, seldom based on perception and qualitative observation. PPASAU has been used for a year and success factors include an increased overall consideration for universal accessibility in municipal projects, complemented by efficient training of city workers and advocacy organizations. Public health authorities were compelled to include universal accessibility to their discourse and Montreal's physically active development plan too. This is the first assessment tool to bring together urban development, road safety, active lifestyle, sustainability, and accessibility, integrating all universal design principles into its evaluation process. It is a leverage for changing professional practices within city to use walkability data for active transportation in space traditionally allowed to car. Uh, it's used by uh, urban planners, urban designers, engineering. Okay. The second part of our project, currently uh, underway, is to link the tool to a responsive mobile application with electronics form, geolocalization, and an open database. This will enable large-scale data collection, efficient processing and analysis within an easy access hosting space for all urban planning professional, uh, advocacy organization, locally, maybe internationally. I have nothing about that to show you today. You know IT uh, development always take uh, longer than we expect. <laughs> I'm supposed to have something today, but it's not ready now. It will be ready for uh, collect, uh, collecting data this summer. We have a lot of uh, environments who are waiting for that then. Next time, maybe I will be able to show you the result. Okay. We aim at large scale use by public organizations that have voiced a need to provide consistent data on projects with consideration for pedestrian comfort and safety and the needs of people with disability and elderly uh, people. PPASAU has a non-for-profit self-financing model that provides sufficient funding to be reinvested re into the technology. We do not uh, build it alone, and uh, we, I want uh, to thank our collaborator for their support, insight, and expertise as we were testing and adjusting the method to the needs of our citizens, including people with disabilities. PPASAU become reality thanks to our partner at Montreal uh, Public Health Department and the financial support of Office des Personnes Handicapées du Québec and Montreal Physique Active Team. PPSEU uh, was awarded yesterday night, uh, and thank you uh, at Zero Project. It was also awarded uh, recognition at Good Practice 2016 by uh, International Design for All Foundation. And uh, in conclusion, if if you are interested in an opportunity to analyze your urban environment with our tool or to make it available in your city, please contact us. And if you want to see all the 100 uh, indicators, I have it on paper to show you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Uh, any questions for clarification? Okay, well, um, we will move on to um, Katie uh, O'Reilly.
um, who's going to talk about the um, uh, on-demand accessible transportation from a Chicago perspective. Katie. Hello. Um, thank you, of course, to Zero Project for having us. I was telling some people last night that it's very refreshing to be in an event like this where you don't have to convince people that access and inclusion is important. And um, so it's really, really great to be here. But what I'm going to talk with all of you about today is Open Taxis, um, which is the centralized dispatch for the wheelchair accessible taxis for the city of Chicago. Um, I realized after going through my presentation and then after talking with people over the past couple of days, thank you, um, that the presentation looks at more of, of what we're doing and not as much as how we're doing it. And so please let me know if you have questions and I'll do my best to, to go into kind of the, the back of the house stuff um, while I'm, I'm talking with you. But the, so Open Taxis is operated by Open Doors organization. So Open Doors is the, the parent company of Open Taxis. Open Doors is a nonprofit um, based in Chicago, but we work across the world. Um, we were founded in, in 2000 after our executive director personally experienced disability, and so he founded um, Open Doors to um, make the, the travel, transportation, and tourism industries more accessible for people with disabilities. And so um, much of our work is in uh, aviation with airlines and airports, and then we, we do work with the ride-sharing companies and with taxis. Um, what put us on, on the map in the first place, um, and then we trip, I guess tripled it, um, was our, our first market study on travelers with disabilities where we looked at their, their travel patterns. And so where they were going, what they were spending, how they were booking it. Um, and that's been quite the resource for um, the travel industry because it also talks about obstacles that people are facing when they're traveling um, based on disability type. And so it's been, it's been a pretty great resource. Um, but so we began operating open taxis in 2013, and so I'll throw out wheelchair accessible vehicles or WAVES is what I'll refer to our taxis as moving forward. Um, but before we started operating open taxis, we, um, the city of Chicago had just one taxi affiliation or taxi company that was operating the whole system. And there's a number of taxi companies with a number of vehicles, and as you can imagine, when there's one company operating an entire dispatch, there, um, there's some favorites being played with their drivers, and then because they didn't have enough cabs on the road for, to meet the demand, um, there were you know, about 200 people per month that weren't getting picked up. The people who were, who were getting picked up were waiting one to two hours, which is a lot for us, and I know that accessible transportation is tough across the world, um, so one to two hours maybe doesn't seem as bad, but it is when you're expecting a taxi to get there as soon as you, as you call. Um, and so when we started operating, uh, the city of Chicago put out a request for proposals and asked, um, asked for somebody to come up with a new idea on how this is going to be better. And so we um, came up with the idea of a centralized dispatch. And so instead of having one taxi company running the dispatch, we don't have any um, direct affiliations with any of the cab companies in the city. We're more of the middleman. So we're the people who connect the people who need the transportation with the people who have it. Um, and so we're a 24-7, 365 um, operation. We have dispatchers on site at all times. Um, when we first started, we had less than 150 vehicles on the road, closer to 100, um, less than 200 drivers. There's a, a difference there because some of the drivers, because of leasing costs of these vehicles, um, some drivers share their cabs with somebody else. And so that's why there's, there's more drivers than there are cars. Um, but it started on a, on a Google Doc spreadsheet and um, you know, writing, writing things down on paper to try and make these orders work, and we had about three employees. Now, in, when, I, when I made this presentation, we had 309 vehicles. Now we have 320 um, that are on the road. The city of Chicago has a goal of 400 waves by the end of this year. And um, there's over 400 drivers at this point. We developed a... Um, pretty intuitive software that allows our dispatchers to connect directly with the drivers. Um, there's location tracking, and so if somebody calls in for a ride, then we're able to locate the driver that's closest and, and push out that ride um, to them, or just push it out to the drivers who are in that area um, in general and see who's available. Um, we're able to give the drivers notes about the customer, so if it's somebody who's blind, we can let them know what color shirt they're wearing so that they can go inside and meet them. If uh, you know somebody has a power wheelchair, a manual wheelchair, we can let them know um, 
you know, that kind of information. If they need to pick somebody up in the back of the building as opposed to in the front, we can let them know all of that, and all of that gets um, tracked on or gets, I guess, pushed out through our software. Um, we also have a mobile application that people can use to book rides, and so similar to Uber or Lyft, where they can put in their, their pickup address and their destination, they can book that way. That connects them directly to the driver, so it takes out um, you know, speaking with the dispatchers. But um, the only difference with our, our app compared to Uber and Lyft is that there's no payment option within it, so you would still need to pay for, um, pay for your ride when you're there. But at this point, we've got six full-time dispatchers, we have part-time dispatchers, and then administrative staff, and so we've grown quite a bit. Um, how it works, though, on the, the driver side, so if the, you know, somebody, a taxi driver has their, their chauffeur's license to be a, a licensed taxi driver, um, they can also apply to be, and if they have a vehicle that's available with their company, they can apply to be a, um, a wave driver. And in order to become a wave driver, they have to, one, have the vehicle, two, go through our training. And so the training is, part of it is about our, um, the whole process and what they as a driver need to know, but then the other part of it is disability awareness and etiquette. And so we're training them, you know, how to assist somebody who's blind, how to assist with breaking down somebody's chair if it can be stowed in the back, um, how to communicate with somebody who has, you know, each major, major disability type, and especially with our, our older population, just kind of knowing when to ask if they need assistance or not. Um, and once they go through that, then they come in and they get a tablet. So every one of our drivers has, or every vehicle has its own tablet, and the tablet comes from us, and that's part of what the... Um, where our, our finances go, are that because each of these vehicles has their own tablet, then there's data that goes with that. And so as the city is putting on more um, cars, as they want to you know, increase the number of vehicles that are on the road, um, we have to put more tablets out there. And so we're funded by the city of Chicago, but so where our, our finances go is into the, the tablets, into the data, and then um, the software is a cost, and then there's also our, our dispatchers and our admin staff's salaries. Um, and then, I think that's it for how, how that works. But so, right, so the city of Chicago, we get a monthly stipend from them. We've been really lucky, and I know that this isn't the case in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of areas, most areas, but the city of Chicago, um, they, they require that for each taxi company, 20% of their fleet is accessible. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a number of vehicles, though, so an affiliation can have two, and at that point, they're not required to to have, to have um, an accessible vehicle on the road. I want to say it's maybe 10 at least that they have to have um, for, to qualify for that. And, um, and so they've, they've made that requirement, but then on top of that, there's an accessibility fund that the city of Chicago has. And for every, every Uber, Lyft, rideshare um, fare, 10% of that fare, that cost, goes into this accessibility fund. And so the city of Chicago is sitting on a handful of money that they're now incentivizing these cab companies to go beyond just that 20% um, requirement. And they are. Um, what's made all of this work, though, and, and what's made um, the, the number of people interested in driving waves work is an incentive program. Because the taxi fares are the same for one of these vehicles. And let me just fast forward for just a second just to show you. So these are the two kinds of cars that our drivers are driving. The red ones, that's an MV1. That's the, the only purpose-built wheelchair accessible vehicle that's on the road. It's, it's manufactured in Indiana, and, and unfortunately, they're going out of business. Um, but it's expensive to buy these cars and to own them and maintain them. Um, and then the other one, there's converted minivans. And so that's what, what everybody is driving. And they all have side entry. Um, we were a big proponent of that. We don't really like the rear entry kind of vehicle. I don't think there's much dignity in, in having somebody sit in the trunk. But then on top of that, there's, um, you know, when you're loading and unloading, it's right into traffic. And I don't know if anybody's driven in Chicago before, but you don't want to be loading and unloading into traffic. Um, but so those are the, the vehicles that, that they drive. But the, the reason that, um, there's our app. But the reason that this has worked so well um, is because of, like I said, the incentive program. And so because we can't charge people more money for their taxi fares just because they require more space, um, the drivers of these vehicles are making the same amount on each fare as a driver of a Prius would. But with these vehicles, there's more gas that goes into it, there's more vehicle maintenance, and then just being a wave driver in general, there's more work that goes into providing that kind of transportation. So you're getting out of your car 
in the winter, in the rain, in any kind of weather, and you're helping somebody into your vehicle and then you're tying them down. There's just more that goes into it. And so we had to find a way to make it worth it for these drivers to, to drive waves. And so um, when we first started, we tried gas gift cards, we tried insurance discounts, we tried cash. Not even cash would work. Um, and so what we came up with was a voucher program. And so at the airport, when taxi drivers go into the airport, they have to sit in a taxi lot. And the line that they sit in, they can be sitting there for two to three hours, especially with the ride share phenomenon that we're dealing with now. The taxi industry is really suffering. And so there's a lot of people who sit at that airport for a long time. What these vouchers do is they get their, the drivers into the short lane at the airport. So they can get right in and maybe they wait 15, 20 minutes in a, in a shorter line and they put a monetary value of these vouchers at about $50. So on this voucher schedule, that's a picture of what the vouchers look like. Um, but on this voucher schedule, and, and this has changed time to time to make sure that, again, it's, it's worth it and it's working for everybody. Um, but in a 24 hour period, every ride that a driver picks up through our system, um, they earn vouchers for it. And so the first two, there's two vouchers each, and then every voucher or every ride after that is one voucher. Um, so these vouchers, they expire after 60 days, but if a driver isn't doing any kind of rides for us, and they're able to go right to the airport, and they can take you know, as many customers as they want, and hopefully it's, it's a ride that's, that's further, and, and so they can you know, make more money that way. But this has really been the only thing that's been working. It's the only thing that people want. I mean, this is, you know, paper gold, essentially. And I mean, there was a black market for it. People were, were counterfeiting our vouchers to get more. Um, you'd be surprised how, how important it is. But, um, but so with this, as far as cost goes, I mean, all we're doing is paying for the paper for it, and we're paying for the ink, and we're printing them, and we're cutting them, and we're putting them in folders. And that's what's made on-demand wheelchair accessible transportation possible for the city, is, is that piece of paper there. Um, so since we started um, in 2014 for our first full year of operation, we had about 34,800 um, completed rides. And now as of November of, of last year, we had 83,000 rides that were completed. And so it's, it's grown quite a bit, but then there's, there's, fast forward just one, there's some troubles with that because as the number of, of drivers are increasing, we need to keep the, the demand increasing too. Um, and so what our, our chief of operations, what he's been doing is a lot of going out to uh, rehab hospitals and assisted living centers and making connections that way so that there's more transportation options there. Um, paratransit or the kind of dial-a-ride system is not preferred you know, by people with disabilities. They have to book at least 24 hours in advance. There's limitations on where the paratransit service will take them. Um, and then, you know, there's between, what, four and six people that might be riding with you, and if the first person is late, every person after that is late too. And you're going to medical appointments, you're going to work, you're going to school. And so um, we just we need to make sure that, that the, the demand is, is increasing. And then um, there's also, another challenge has been a lack of cooperation by the airport's parking department. So um, there's two airports in, in Chicago, and there's a, a, a company that operates the parking system there, and they also operate the line. And there appears to be, allegedly, a, um, a very close relationship between the parking companies and some of these taxi companies. And um, they're not letting the wave drivers through as much as they should be. Um, we've got four different terminals at Chicago O'Hare Airport, and oftentimes our guys are only allowed into one of the lines, so into one of the terminals, and you, know, you have to wait 10, 15 minutes to get one of them to another terminal, which isn't, <laughs> which isn't, um, which isn't necessary because our guys are there anyway. And so, I mean, those are the challenges that we face with that. Um, that's it. Any questions? Okay, so we have um, a couple of very interesting uh, presentations here. So are there any questions? If you have questions for the first presenter, Mary, um, she has asked that you would email those uh, to her, but obviously they can be more broadly discussed here. So, any questions from you, please? Yes, please, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, I just like to hear more um, about incentives that are given that are working, because it is expensive. Um, whether and also for the other projects for transport systems, 
what models are working, what subsidies exist from governments, whether it's for new systems and also especially for retrofitting. So is this particularly for Katie or also for Sophie? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, should we just see, are there another couple of questions to take as well? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, all, all that we've really been able to find that's working for, for our drivers at least are these vouchers because they can, if they go to the airport, they can get a ride that's, you know, half a mile away or they can get a ride that's 20 miles away. And that makes a big difference, especially when they're not getting as many rides as they would want. Um, our drivers are getting between two and maybe four rides in a day and so they're not getting as many I mean the voucher schedule if I were to put the whole thing up there it goes down to you know the tenth ride that you pick up but that's just not really happening right now and so really that's just what we found I mean, it, and it, it's all about money really and you know the city of Chicago they have that fund and so they're incentivizing the taxi companies to put more vehicles on but they're having a hard time agreeing or, or really wanting to do it as much as we would hope that they would um, because there's so much maintenance that goes in to, to those kind of vehicles, and so um, I'm interested too if there's anybody else who has an idea because we tried, we've tried everything, and, and the paper is working, but um, you'd think that maybe there could be something else, and we just haven't found that yet. So, so Katie, maybe um, if I could just ask, so, so the incentive is per ride rather than the initial purchase of the, the accessible vehicle? For, for the drivers, it's per ride. The initial purchase is for the company. So we have to hope that the company wants to do it. Um, the city of Chicago, people can also have, they can have their own medallion, they can have their own taxi that they operate. Um, but there's not, there's not many that do that because it's so expensive to buy the vehicles. Um, and then to have a medallion as well, and that's kind of like your license to own that vehicle and, and operate it as a taxi. Um, but for leasing, I, there was one driver who told me that his lease each week is $750. Um, and that's just per week. And so if he's not making at least $750 in a week, mm -hmm. then he's you know negative on the week just because he wants to drive that car. And so we're making it really hard for these guys to provide the kind of transportation that we want them to when we're basically you know making them go broke doing it. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And. Sophie, did you want to comment? Mm, not about no? this side. <laughs> okay. Okay, from. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like Amanda. to comment because I found this um, panel really interesting. I mean, the cheapest form of public transport is walking. And so that requires no um, subsidy for individuals. And so that's why um, Sophie's presentation on walkability of cities is so important because, and why so much of it comes back to planning and how you plan living and traveling environments. And obviously you're never going to get away from the need to travel. Um, and so just, just from a South African perspective, we're really interested in the, the Chicago project because we've got two dialeride services in the country which are kind of legacy services. And they're fi they, well, they offer a limited service for you know, the 300 of people who can get that subsidized service. But for the 6,000 who can't, they're stuck. And so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's got to be a multidisciplinary approach to solving this problem of the way urban space is, is, operates and is developed. But actually, it's, walking is cheap. And so we have to get to that point where everybody can walk to the destinations that they want to be able to, to get to. Or if they have to use transport, then it has to be inclusive. It can't be that there's a separate service for other people. And I think one of the things that I've learned a lot from being in this job is that we have not been designing inclusive transport. And it's not a minority issue, it's a majority issue. I can't make an ad about that. Um, we always walk. When we use public transportation, we are pedestrian in a part of our, uh, our uh, mobility. And when you, we use our car, we walk a little part too. And it's very important to think about, about that. And too much project to increase walkability do not include needs of people with disabilities. Uh, they, we want to, um, to improve uh, health with 
walk, but it's not only people in good health what walk it's everybody is good for everybody and we have to include it and when we we think about public transportation if the city do not make the job uh, on the pathways crossing and things like that it's not possible to reach the public transportation uh, it's not possible to to take off the taxi and to go at destination it's we have to work it together and it's a big problem in uh, in montreal because we have uh, buses with the ramp but in some place we have no uh, no sidewalk and the ramp is too uh, I, I don't I'm steep thank you very much it's too steep and it's not possible to have a pub accessible the public transportation in in this place and it's not the uh, under the jurisdiction of the public transport, but on the jurisdiction of the city, and they have to work together. Okay, well, I think um, if you can just join me in thanking uh, our North American uh, participants. And so we're going to move straight on from, from three North American women to three Austrian men. <laughs> so if you could come up and uh, take your places, please. Okay, so um, uh, we're, we're in the, the, th the third and sort of final uh, part of, of this uh, session, uh, I guess overall looking at uh, assistive technologies. And uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce uh, Ralph uh, Tato from the Federal Ministry of Social uh, Affairs uh, here in Austria. And he's going to look at um, responsibility challenges and uh, perspectives. And he may stand while he does this. <laughs> thank you, Ralph. So thank you very much. I don't like to make presentation by sitting. I think my my feet, my legs don't want. <laughs> uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Ralf Tato. I'm from the Austrian Federal Ministry of uh, Labour, Social Affairs, Health, and Consumer Protection. Health is the new thing in in our. Uh, uh, a major uh, business, so to say, uh, Ministry of Social Affairs. Today I'm uh, allowed to represent uh, Manfred Paringer, our Director General, who is uh, responsible for long-term care affairs and uh, disability issues. He appreciates your work and he's very unhappy that he couldn't be personally be present on the topic and uh, discuss with you. Uh, but for me, it's a great honor to be here, a very great honor uh, as the representative for the Survey of Application for Assistive Technologies um, to speak here today. Uh, within, with the following slides, I'm allowed to bring you closer to our responsibility, the uh, National Action Plan on Disability, and our project uh, in the area of assistive technology. So now let's drive right to the left. <laughs> No, it was the right one. Um, our agenda. The Ministry of uh, Social Affairs has a range of responsibility, among others. It is responsible for long-term care and uh, disability law and policy. In the area of uh, long-term care, we are responsible for care allowance, caring relatives, 24-hour support, and the long-term care fund. Within the long-term care fund, there is uh, the possibility to support innovative projects such as uh, Embed Assisted Living and uh, Active and Assisted Living, AAL. And uh, our most important acts in the area of uh, disability are the Federal Disability Equality Act, 
the Disability uh, Employment Act and the Federal Disability Act. The protection and support for disabled people is uh, legally embedded in uh, the Austrian Federal Disability Equality Act with uh, the aim to um, protect against discrimination in daily life. The, the Austrian Federal Disability Act with the objective of the best possible participation in social life and at least uh, the Austrian Disability Employment Act with the aim of vocational integration and the regulation of rights and obligations of uh, employees with disabilities. The, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. For the implementation of the CRPD and National Action Plan Disability 2012 to 2020, in short, uh, NAP disability has been concluded. The NAP disability constitutes to, um, the long-term strategy of the federal government for the realization of the UN Disability Rights Convention. It consists of over 250 measures split into eight focus areas, such as uh, disability policy, protection against discrimination, accessibility, education, employment, self-determined life, health and rehabilitation, as well as creation of uh, awareness and information. Um, in the part of awareness and information, there is also my personal biggest part um, in the resort. Many of the actions included are located in the technological sector and concern, among other things, assistive technologies. Goal of the NAP is a comprehensive vocational, societal and social participation. Assistive technologies. Assistive technologies are of big importance uh, for the creation and preservation of personal independence. For this exists, for example, the program Benefit with the NAP. Aim of this program is uh, to support science and economy in the development of assistive technologies. This program is also supported by the UE program Embed Assisted Living. the right to work. People with disabilities are affected by unemployment above the average. Only a few employees can envision a person with disabilities in their company. Here the assistive technologies are opening up new job opportunities and chances. Thus suddenly the exercise of a multitude of professions is possible which weren't be possible before. The Ministry of Social Affairs provides specific support in this area. This includes single concerned persons and also companies. The, in the course of the Zero Project, nominated project uh, Top Easy of the Austrian Press Agency, which provides news in easy language, is, support, is a supported project of the Ministry for Social Affairs in the technological area as well, as you may see yesterday. Concrete projects of the Ministry of Social Affairs. Specifically, two science prizes are awarded alternately by the Ministry of Social Affairs. 2019, the Sociopolitical Science Award of the Ministry of Social Affairs called Sowieso, and uh, 2018, the Science Award Inclusion to Natural Science and Technology called Wintech. Thereby, the WinTech is also part of the NAP Goal 237, which means awareness raising and spreading on information about the UN Convention and on the rights of people with disabilities. With the WinTech, there is more done for the involvement or inclusion of people with disabilities and barriers are removed. Everyone who did scientific research on something which supports the inclusion of disabled people is able to take part in the WinTech. The WinTech took already place in 2015 and 2016. The prices are now 3, 5 and 10,000 euro, as well as a comprehensive marketing of the awardees. So let's take a look to the Wing Tech 2015. The first prize went to the gentleman Talan Nussbaum, and Nussbaum, where I'm uh, very happy they are today with us. You can see it behind for me in the right corner. They've really done a great work. And um, they developed the 4D joysticks 
which uh, enables most complex control based on four digital and four analog channels. The second prize went to Mr. Bergmeister, who developed a bionic prothesis, which movement can be controlled through swords. The third prize was awarded to Mrs. Orkstein, who developed a system for the adjustment of easy usable common devices for the usage with smartphones and computers. For example, with the combination of a puncher with a magnet and a recording software, the control of smartphones was made possible by simply pressing the puncher. The Vintec 2016. Here the first prize went to Mr. Beeling, who developed a long hand, which makes it possible to communicate with deafblind people in any way, digital, analog, as you like. The second place was won by the team Feigl, Deinhofer and Eigner, who developed the so-called flip mouse, a self-construction kit for below 100 euro, which allows it to control mobile phones or PCs only with the mouse. And uh, the third prize went to the team Pucher, who were able to prove that blind students are best able to learn when they're getting the subject matter presented to them either with their own synthesized voice or the synthesized voice of the according subject teacher. So let's end with a conclusion and outlook. The new federal government has decided for an evaluation and continuation of the National Action Plan Disability in their program. Thus the 2020 ending plan shall be continued in a new one from 2021 to 2030. A further interesting measure in the area of assistive technology is the implementation of a special ministry for digitalization. Assistive technologies will be of even greater significance in the future and can provide a relevant contribution for the comprehensive barrier-free participation. Uh, one aspect of particular importance is, as is always emphasized by the Austrian Federal Minister, Mrs. Hartinger-Klein, a personalized approach. Why well, I want to close with the following quote. The best use of technology is achieved by matching devices to persons, not vice versa, and the use of a person-first perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you um, very much indeed, uh, Ralph. Um, so now we move to um, unless are there, it was such a clear presentation, I'm assuming there are no questions of clarification. But um, we will move to uh, Martin uh, Hedvogel from the uh, Magistratens Direction Graz, and he's talking about accessible administration of the city of Graz. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martin Hedvogel. Uh, I'm the director of the magistrate of the city of uh, Graz and therefore I'm responsible for the efficiency of the administration and the legality of uh, the city's administration. Uh, the city of Graz is the second largest city uh, of Austria. It's located south in the south of Austria um, and we have now about 290,000 inhabitants. The administration consists of uh, 3,500 employees and you can see uh, that about 10% of the employees, employees uh, are people with disabilities. And I think uh, we also have a long tradition uh, in uh, striving to make the city accessible. Um, we started with a unit uh, special unit for barrier-free uh, buildings, uh, 1985. We have a disability advisory council since 1995 and a special commissioner for people with disabilities since uh, 1997. And uh, the city of Graz was also the first city of Austria uh, which adopted a municipal action plan uh, for uh, disabilities uh, to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities. Um, with eight fields of uh, action, 
uh, from participation uh, to, to mobility, schools, culture, awareness rising, information uh, to, to data uh, and statistics. Uh, I have it here. It is a plan with um, 140 pages. So I cannot uh, give you all information, but um, I want to highlight uh, some, some measures uh, of, of the city. Um, I, I begin with all administration uh, buildings. They are all uh, uh, barrier-free. Uh, also, uh, the buildings in the uh, medieval uh, center of the city of Graz, it was very expensive, uh, of course, to make them uh, barrier-free. Uh, but now we have, uh, for example, in the city hall, special uh, tactile guidelines, uh, hearing induction uh, loops, uh, a tactile model of the city hall. Um, it is uh, used by, by, by many tourists. Um, and uh, we have uh, all doors with uh, automatic uh, door opener and now two uh, additional uh, lifts not only uh, for wheelchairs, uh, but for the majority. Uh, uh, and uh, recently we installed um, a lot of uh, video screens, and uh, this was very interesting for us because we tested uh, them uh, with visually impaired users, and then we changed uh, uh, the position of all screens, uh, the height of all screens, uh, the type uh, size, and uh, also the contrast uh, of uh, the inscription. Um, we are providing a lot of services uh, on the internet. Uh, for example, an uh, online city map where you can find all acoustical traffic lights, all disabled parking uh, spaces, and uh, all accessible public toilets. And if uh, for example, a traffic light uh, is broken. Uh, you can report this uh, on the internet, and we uh, uh, give you then uh, the report uh, of uh, yes, uh, fixing it. Um, this is a, a special service uh, for all uh, traffic lights. It's not only used by disabled persons, uh, but, but also by by all people who, who can uh, vote there also for their um, uh, famous traffic lights. Okay. Okay. Um, in the field of uh, education, I want to point out that we find uh, suitable schools for every disabled student nearby the place of uh, residence. And we have some, we have some special offers uh, like uh, special rooms for therapy dogs um, and uh, relaxation rooms in, in uh, the schools for autistic children. Uh, the libraries uh, offer a, a, a large offer of large print books uh, for older readers, reading classes to lend. Uh, we have free shipping of books and, uh, of course, also other media for blind people. Um, we have uh, a lot of media and sign language uh, for deaf people, and um, we have a lot of volunteers uh, who read books uh, for older people or blind uh, people. Um, we think it's uh, very important to raise the awareness uh, where awareness is really needed, uh, especially for architects and uh, city planners, but also for our staff. Uh, and we uh, make a lot of trainings with them, with wheelchairs, with uh, simulation classes, so that they can uh, feel the needs uh, of uh, disabled persons. And we uh, offer a special uh, guide for uh, planning of accessible buildings. Um, it is for free and uh, Every architect uh, can, can use it, and uh, a lot of architects uh, use it. Um, our website uh, is, of course, uh, a website according to the web content accessibility guidelines. 
Uh, every page has a read out loud function uh, and uh, the content is very clear structured. Uh, so uh, it is also um, better for screen readers uh, and we be uh, testing uh, all screen readers uh, for this uh, website and we, we, we look uh, for really clear statements uh, not only at the website, but also uh, at, at the whole communication. Yes, uh, this was an overview, and if you want to know more about uh, uh, the accessible city, you can watch uh, a, a video uh, on YouTube. Uh, it uh, points out more the, the, the fields of tourism, culture, mobility, um, and uh, it is also in English, but you, c you can find it only uh, with uh, German keywords. Uh, I'm sorry, Barriere <laughs> Frei uh, Graz. And uh, then uh, you can find uh, the video English with subtitles. Thank you very much. Thank you. You forgot to mention it's such a beautiful city as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, any questions for clarification? Okay, well then we, we will move on to our uh, last speaker in this session, uh, Roland uh, Kapata. Um, uh, Czech name, but nonetheless, he is going to talk about the Viennese model of uh, mobility for all. Thank you very much. So, I'm a project manager uh, of Vinalinian. I'm already working for 30 years for this company. And from the early beginning, uh, I was engaged to improve our service levels on the Vienna underground system. And uh, I was also working at the Austrian Standard Institute and had very good contact uh, with uh, disabled people over there because it was, we were starting uh, to uh, develop an Austrian standard which didn't exist. And uh, so step by step I, was, I became uh, also a researcher on research projects because the market didn't work uh, as uh, a carrier of public transport. Uh, we would, as a, as in another case, we would uh, uh, bought uh, solutions on the market, but the market wasn't able to, to deliver solutions, so, so we had to work on solutions on their own uh, in a, a partnership with uh, uh, with uh, disabled uh, people organizations. Uh, this was uh, the, the way how I started to, to become a research uh, with research and development projects. So first I would like to give you some information because you're coming from all over the world to, to Vienna. Some of the, them may be the first time over here. So Wiener Linien, uh, the owner of... Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, this way? This way? No. no. Okay. Pardon? So, I give you some uh, general information about my company. Uh, the owner of our company is the city of Vienna. We have uh, less than 9,000 employees and almost a billion, billion of uh, uh, users and passengers per year. We are operating uh, five metro lines, uh, 28 uh, tram lines and bus lines. And uh, fortunately, we uh, didn't stop the operation of tram lines after World War II, because that happened in plenty of other cities. And now they, uh, they reinvent uh, tramway lines uh, in London as well and uh, in other cities. Uh, but we always had uh, these uh, tramway lines in operation. And uh, we did not uh, so bad during the last years because uh, if you an indicator of uh, a service is also the model split, and we are able to achieve 37% uh, for public transport and only 25% uh, pedestrians and 25% of uh, individual motor car circulation, motor car circulation, and. Uh, 
So I guess it is quite a good performance and accessibility became certainly a uh, uh, part of the philosophy of our uh, company. Uh, and uh, we, but we uh, care about all matters of public transport. We maintain our facilities, our rolling stock. We are uh, preparing uh, public standards, and we don't sell what uh, on the on the market is delivered. So we, we prepare duty catalogs, and they have to design our, our rolling stock according to the demand of our users. We have a user focused uh, designs. This is one of uh, our philosophy uh, in all matters, uh, even in station and station buildings, and all of our station buildings are equipped with elevators, and we were able to finish uh, this retrofitting program already 2004. So you see, this uh, uh, is not uh, not normal, but if you look to London or to Paris or to Rome, they are far away to, to, to become soon in, in such a position. And I was also working uh, in an expert group on a European project that was called uh, the Mediate Project. Uh, uh, there were in the expert group a fellow from Barcelona, from Spain, Francesca Regal, uh, from uh, Design for All movement over there. There was uh, from Siemens, Germany, uh, a blind fellow in this expert group, uh, a lady from uh, Transport for London, and, uh, and me uh, representing Austria with our experiences and the Vienna's model. And so uh, my uh, experience from this uh, 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 European project was everybody was talking about uh, accessibility but everybody was talking about something different and uh, so uh, it, it was pretty strange because in the working groups we were steering where there were members from 17 European countries from Bulgaria to Portugal and uh, in some of the, those countries uh, the accessibility had, they didn't have even a standard uh, concerning accessibility and uh, not an anti-discrimination act, in others they had, and the standards uh, were, di were different in different countries. So, uh, and we were working on a best practice catalog and then we, we, we saw what was done in different countries, how were the, the problems solved. And so there, you, the standard is not all. You need also uh, uh, planning uh, competence. Uh, what, how do you apply a standard? And what, what are you doing with the standard? Do you have uh, just a standard for to, to keep it somewhere in, in the pocket or, or lift uh, the standard? And how do you lift it? And how and me as a project manager, so I was forced to do and to realize and to apply the standard on real projects. So. Yeah, and uh, so let let's see. Uh, we we did so many things, retrofitting programs, not only uh, with elevators and ramps. All of our stations are accessible for wheelchair users, and uh, as well, we were implementing uh, tactile orientation systems. And if you have a look at uh, the tactile orientation system, I recognize uh, it, it's, it's a different planning philosophies in different countries. The British and the French use it on a different way than we do it in Austria or in Germany uh, and in Japan uh, because we are organizing an orientation system. What I was uh, also in charge for the visual orientation system and from me, for me in the beginning I'm one of the inventors we were the first company all over Austria we implemented a tactile orientation system in underground stations and for, for me it was clear to make an orientation system in, in Britain or in France to make just uh, a tactile tiles along the platform edge just for indicating danger this is we're doing as well, but uh, you can use this uh, on a different purposes and on a better way. So we make the line in London, if you come to London Underground, you see written on, on the platform edge, mind the gap. But they plant this tactile line exactly at the gap. 
the this is out of my point of view senseless because you have got, you've got the gap. But it's dangerous. This area is very dangerous because the trains entering with 80 kilometer per, per hour. So this is this should you should mind the gap and you shouldn't uh, place this stack the lines at the gap. So we did it from the early beginning, one and a half meter away. Uh, from the gap and then you can move and can move it on this line and then you have turn offs uh, to other facilities uh, which you need if you, you want to come to the surface or to the exit of the station then we have crossing lines and turn offs and crossings and so the, we have implemented those tactile system in the whole station, then they can easily move from the entrance to the platform and so on the platform to each other part wherever they want to go to in, in the building. This is the way how we use this system in Austria and in other countries, others do it on a different way. And we were discussing that uh, in, uh, in this European project and certainly everybody, this was my experience, everybody is thinking he's doing better. So if the British are doing their way, they might do however they want to do it. I do it this way because uh, we have agreed in Austria with our disability organizations, this is a better way for us how to use this system. And uh, yeah, uh, well, I might go back because uh, it, it was another uh, question, very interesting because you, we are using art articulated buses and it's uh, in the project we, we are also working together with Transport for London and the UITP movement and we have very good relations to them and at the final conference of uh, the immediate project I asked my fellow, the fellows of uh, London Transport for London why do you use double taker buses? Is, is it really a, a wonderful system? You have just one door to get on and one door to get off. Maybe with an articulated buses, you have four doors, and then each door you might get off, and you might get off. It's much quicker to leave or to get on the bus, and you don't waste your time at stops. On the other hand, we have acceleration programs to influence traffic lights just to move faster. And all the time, the gain with this uh, acceleration programs, they lose much more time at the stops. And then they told me, because we were talking about gaps, uh, they, they, they told me, yeah, you're right, we, we also would like to use uh, articulated buses, but as long as the major of London is on power, we don't have a chance to, to do it. Do so in London, because he is old-fashioned and he wants to run a regular services in double-taker buses. And he, he prefers to, to, to lose time at the stops because this is a tradition, this is the way how we do it. And this, you have also gaps in mind. I, I'm, I, I love Britain, I don't want to criticize Britain, <laughs> but this was the answer I got. And uh, sorry, you might have similar situations over this, but I was really uh, amazed that uh, people trust really in politicians. I, I don't trust so much in them. I trust in techniques and in, in real in programs and, and in projects. And uh, I guess uh, the experts should, uh, they were forced to work out arguments for the politicians how to, to keep on running double taker press. Uh, like this is uh, the wrong way round uh, out of uh, uh, concerning my express so and we did so, so much uh, during uh, the decades uh, for handicapped people so I we decided to uh, to, to find out uh, together with uh, the disability persons uh, when can we really say a station a station building or a service is accessible I, I understood on the European level we won't come to each other because a different country, different philosophy. So I tried to, to figure it out on a national project and a research project, uh, supported and founded by one minute. It's quick, okay. So <laughs> let, let's see. Um, 
Yeah, so I, we, we found in this project we started with the handicap analysis and uh, you know in uh, statistics uh, politicians use very often statistics and I prefer uh, the expression handicap because all of us, we are, have a handicap. So even the best golf players of the world has a handicap and Mr. Hirscher is a wonderful skier in Austria but he was not able to win in, in the last race uh, the gold medal in slalom. And, so we all have a handicap and we started our life already with a handicap because we are not skilled and we are carried in prams with our parents and so we, our parents would be happy to have uh, an elevator or to have a low throw vehicle uh, to get on or to get off. And then even if we are skilled or are skilled are developed and we, we, we are passing the university, we never arrive at 100% because uh, you just have to move maybe to, uh, to Russia where I was invited of, uh, this, this, uh, from the city of Russia and I was using the public transport over there and everything was written in Cyrillic letters but I was not able to read Cyrillic letters and if you go to, to an uh, Arab country they write with different uh, typefaces from right to left so I have a handicap and all of us have a handicap and my handicap uh, because I'm native speak in German, uh, but if I have to speak in, in English or in French, so this is my second language, so I'm, I'm not able to express myself uh, as I would be able to do in German. And uh, in, if you get older, you have the same problem, and you you're hard of hearing, teeth, and other devices. And then, uh, let's see, we, we uh, developed the certification methodology, uh, and uh, uh, just uh, together with uh, handicapped uh, uh, people and the representatives uh, just to check. We were visiting about 70 uh, stations, uh, station buildings of the Austrian Railway Agency and of, uh, of Wiener Linians, bus stops, and then we had indicators uh, what to care out of, the, we tried to see and out, out of their point of view uh, or, uh, or services. And then we have parameters indicators and then we in the measure catalog we what we have and what should be done and then we have also uh, worked out uh, a scale uh, to, to see where we are. Uh, if you, and we, it's like a traffic signalization, if you are in red, so you are, it's not accessible. Even with foreign uh, help, you are not able to use a service. For instance, uh, if you have a uh, public underground station and there's no elevator, so for the group, for other groups, it might be good, quite good. Blind people won't have a, a difficulty, but in a wheelchair, you don't arrive at the platform. So this is red, even with foreign help, you can't use it. And yellow is, uh, for instance, if you have a central platform without tactile orientation system, so blind people might, might able to, to, to use it by foreign help, but on their own, they might uh, stumble into the tracks, and this is yellow. This is not accessible. So we start, uh, and we uh, a light green. This is uh, signaling that you have already uh, arrived uh, a certain level concerning accessibility, but uh, you have still some uh, homework to do, and to might improve certain uh, devices and facilities to make it better and to come there where we want it to come do in the dark green area for all user group uh, a, a service is suitable and accessible for all. So this is, uh, I'm also in working, this almost, uh, I'm almost finished uh, because I have another uh, project, research and development project, how uh, to design uh, bus and tram stop to bring them on the same level like underground stops. And these areas are not the property of the Wiener Linien, so we depend on the city and, and other departments uh, to, to make that what we want to do. And in this uh, project I recognize plenty of our stops uh, are not big enough, are not dimensioned on the right way, and there are plenty of difficulties in the furniture is very important. And finally I will be showing 
show you, because also if you run uh, low fluid vehicles, you must uh, furnish it on a different way. In former times, passenger quality uh, was uh, defined. The more uh, seating places you've got to realize in the vehicle, the more comfort you have. And this is wrong, because with a, uh, with a high fluid vehicle, you had steps inside, but you didn't have so many wheelchair users or parents with prams into it. And now you need more space in the vehicle, and you can't uh, realize so many seating places so you have and we make simulation programs like uh, I showed you over here with uh, the Austrian Institute of Technology just to furnish uh, inside uh, the vehicle on the right way and also uh, the, the stop areas should be uh, 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 designed and uh, the hubs and everything should be placed on the right place not to disturb uh, uh, the, the exchange uh, uh, of passengers at the stops and to, to realize the short dispatching time. So on that, this is what we work at the moment. And uh, finally, I might finish here right now and uh, I hope you enjoy our services of public transport in Vienna and you have a good time over here uh, on the weekend. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roland. Some very interesting insights as to how the, the city transport system uh, has been made more accessible. Um, so, uh, thank you for staying f over our sessions. We've had quite a number of uh, presentations. We have just a couple of minutes for um, any questions you might have, uh, particularly in the Austrian context or, or more broadly. So please raise your hand if you have a, a question. Yes, Ian, is it? Yeah, hi, Ian McKinnon. Um, yeah, apologies if, if I missed it, but just with regards to the tactile uh, paving on the, the, the metro system, I'm, I'm really interested about how that works. Um, I work in London, so I use the, the, the transport network there a great deal. My, my question would be around, if you're a visitor and, and you don't know that that exists as a blind or partially sighted person, how do you find it and how do you know how it's intended to work. Okay. Immediately. So, yes, uh, we, we were working uh, the, the base uh, of uh, the, the tactile orientation system as the tiles in the stations itself, but we, uh, I also was working on an application of a mobile phone app ex application called Poptis pre on post trip uh, information system and uh, with this app all the, the ways in the in the station and from the station to the bus stop and from the tram stop to 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 each line they are explained for them and they've got it on on the mobile phone and they can use it uh, this way this was one of uh, the research project i realized uh, together always together because all the, the tracks are uh, approved uh, with mobility teachers, and uh, I, I was not able to work it out on my own. I always did it with uh, handicapped people, with blind and visual and impaired people. And so uh, this, now we are even improve uh, this app. And uh, maybe outside, uh, Mr. Bischoff from Bischoff IT uh, is working with us on this project, and uh, we, are, we, we are do improve it uh, still right at the moment. Do we have some more questions? I have a, a question for, for Ralph, because there's not many places you get a socio-political prize. <laughs> and um, it's often a dangerous prize to give. So what, what sort of things are you looking for? What are the criteria? Um, clearly, it's not technical. 
So what is the socio-political um, element? Yeah, the socio-political element is an element of uh, um, other division, so not, not my division, but uh, should be the idea uh, there are also many social-political solutions uh, in Austria will be uh, researched uh, every, every month, every day. And we also want to, to get um, the, the ideas from them and, and to, to look for it if we can use it for government. And so uh, the, I think uh, it starts with a bachelor degree and a master degree. And if you have also some scientific research which you already published, and there is also a, a jury for it, and they look for uh, um, they have their own pointing system. And um, then you get uh, you come into a big catalog with uh, every uh, um, everyone who joined this uh, this uh, prize is in. And yeah, and they really have a good outcome. They did it uh, only once before, but it was really, uh, um, there were many, many uh, solutions where the, um, the government can, can give the ideas further to the politicians and the politicians really some important, do some important things with it, yeah. And it works fine. And this is so, so we, told, we don't only want to have uh, um, the technique and the nature science, we also want to have, of course, the, the social politicians too. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. Um, as a social scientist, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then just finally, uh, Martin, in terms of um, the terrific things you were describing in, in Graz, often when you think of old cities, you think of huge engineering problems in terms of access and so on. And I just wondered when you were describing your experience there, um, how much of it is the engineering problems, how much of it is, if you like, the psychological attitude, um, or are they really part of, of one element of, of change? I, I don't think that I can give you a clear answer. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always a discussion uh, with the architects with, with the uh, protectors of uh, the UNESCO heritage and they all w want to find a solution so usually uh, we, we can go together uh, but I, I don't uh, I'm not able to, to, to give them a, a, a special weight <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I guess uh, you, you cannot have one with, without the other and w whether that's in terms of um, uh, pavements or buildings or assistive technology or broader systems, they all have a, a technological and, and a social element. And I think that's the key thing to, to um, take away. Um, I'd really like to uh, thank the uh, Zero Conference and particularly Martin Fembeck and uh, Peter Charles for the organization of, of this uh, meeting and also our uh, partners in the Austrian uh, government. We had discussions about what sort of forum would work here and I think this has worked uh, very nicely. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the people who have uh, facilitated us through the, the sound and uh, vision. Thank you all. I'm sure you're very hungry. So we will we'll let you away. And just finally, would you uh, give a, a round of applause for our participants here? Thank you very much.